of country estate that you might not imagine was founded by a German Jew. What do you think his motivation was? What was that all about? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, he had come to Britain, Ludwig Messel came to Britain in 1865, and he worked in London as a stockbroker. He set up his own firm. And after 25 years, having been very successful, having made it as a stockbroker in London, he looked to buy a country estate and he found Nyman's. And of course, Nyman's and, and, and that bit of West Sussex um, in those days was much more rural, much more remote than it is today. And I think one of the things he wanted, he wanted to have this private retreat. This wasn't like a grand powerhouse, a grand statement. He wanted a place where he could go and he could be at home with his family. I think for him, that family aspect was also really important. Mm -hmm. um, but it also has a, it has a deeper meaning as well, because back in Germany for so many generations, it had been impossible for Jews to own property. And to come here and to buy a country estate was a really strong signal that the Messels were here to stay. That sense of security of tenure and, and becoming part of English society. What better way of doing it than to build a garden in the Sussex countryside? And he became a very passionate horticulturalist, didn't he? Do you think that was something that he had inherited from his, from his growing up? Was that something that developed because he had this amazing space to fill? I don't think he'd inherited it. No, I mean, basically the Messels in Germany were a very urban family for the past sort of two, three generations. They'd been bankers in Darmstadt, the um, capital of the Grand Duchy of Hesse over in the west of Germany. So they hadn't really come from a horticultural gardening background. Um, but what was fascinating about that area of Sussex at the end of the 19th century, there were a whole lot of these new and very fashionable gardens springing up. So if you think, for example, just four miles down the road, you've got Leonardsley with Sir Edmund Loder. You've got High Beaches, Board Hill, Wakehurst, Sheffield Park, all of this area was a real hotbed of horticultural experimentation. And I think if you if you consider what it must have been like for a, a German Jewish immigrant who wouldn't be into hunting, shooting and fishing and all of the aristocratic pursuits which which often are associated with landed estates. Gardening was an alternative passport into society. And I think that really is what um, attracted Ludwig to it. So the, the, there was, it was, it was the passport into society rather than the particular interest in plants, or do you think that that developed alongside the passport? I think it definitely did. Um, he really took to gardening with um, a, a will and, and with this fantastic head gardener who he appointed very early on, James Coomber, um, who was an absolute superstar and stayed at Nyman's for almost 60 years and was really the person most responsible for developing the garden as we see it now. Um, it was a fantastic partnership and of course when Ludwig died his son Leonard took over Nyman's and kept the same head gardener James Coomber and therefore they had that continuity so I think it really became a passion across both generations, both sort of father, son, and of course, now into the, the, the later generations of us as well. Absolutely. And it was a place where plants were bred and plant, he, he invested in expeditions. Plants came back and were named. Can you tell us a bit about, about that? The, yes. the plants that actually have the Messel name and yes. how they came to be there? Yeah, well, there was, as you say, the two elements of it. There was the ones which came back from the plant hunting expeditions, which was such a feature of Edwardian England in particular, the ones which went to, to China, to Tibet, to Tasmania and Latin America, which were the ones which um, were particularly linked with Nyman's. But then also the plants which were cultivated at Nyman's and the varieties which were pioneered there. Um, and you've got amazing um, camellias, rhododendrons, magnolias, which bear the different names of the Messel family. So 
Camellia maud mesel and Camellia leonard mesel are really quite well known plants. Magnolia leonard mesel, Magnolia Michael Ross, you know, all of the different members of the family are represented in various ways in those plant collections. And one of the things which has been wonderful um, over lockdown, the National Trust has, has done a lot of work over lockdown when the people haven't been able to visit in the same ways as usual. And the ruins which we saw in the film are now being used to plant up a garden within what was the Great Hall. And in that garden, all of these named plants with the Messel name are going to be showcased for the future. So that's a wonderful use of a time which was perhaps less um, open to the public to make that new statement have a new garden developed. And yes, of course, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, this, this concern about plants that were brought in from abroad, having been collected in a kind of colonial sort of way, and the need now to be acknowledging that fact. But it sounds as in, interestingly as well that so many plants were developed there. And was that coma, do you think? Or do you have, do you sort of have a sense of Ludwig out there in his dressing gown, planting, you know, pressing the, the stamens together and actually creating new plants? Do you think it was something he was hands on with? I, I wouldn't have felt that he got his hands too dirty. I think he <laughs> much more of the managerial class um, suggesting that things might be a good idea. But certainly Leonard, his son, um, was very much a, a hands-on horticulturalist. He was, he was very active in the Linnaean Society, in the RHS, um, and then in this extraordinary elite club called the Garden Society, which was there for um, garden owners of a certain class to share their new exotic finds. Um, so yeah, I think that they really got the bug and mm. that, that has really been passed down from generation to generation. Um, if you think, for example, Leonard's daughter, um, Anne, Anne who became the Countess of Ross, she became the garden director at Nymans and was really passionate about the plants there. Um, and actually she then passed on the mantle to the next generation which was my uncle, Alistair Buchanan. And this is actually a, a very poignant moment for us because Alistair remained the family representative at Nyman's for 34 years. And sadly, he just died two weeks ago and we're going to go down to Nyman's for his funeral um, this Saturday. But it's a, really, it's a really wonderful contribution over all of that time to have kept that family tradition and that family connection going. And, and, and we're really celebrating Alistair's life really for having done that and ensured that um, we can then take on that mantle into the next generation. So Alistair was Anne's son and not, Anne... Not son, cousin. Cousin, it okay. It was a little bit <laughs> sideways. <laughs> it does get complicated, but it went a little bit sideways. Ludwig had the two sons, Leonard who took on the property and the younger son was Harold and Harold is our direct ancestor. Yes, yes. Okay, so where shall we go now? We could look at, we could look at a little bit about the descendants and what, because obviously there's a very famous um, descendant of Ludwig Messel sideways and down, who married into the royal family. And between him and them, there's been, huge contribution to the world of arts and science and horticulture. You mentioned Leonard. What would you like to tell us about other people, Oliver Messel? Yes, yeah, indeed. Well, I mean, you've started with um, the, the, the reference to um, Princess Margaret, husband Tony Armstrong Jones. He yeah. obviously was um, a very, very eminent photographer before he married in to the royal family. Oliver Messel, for anybody who has any connection with the stage, was the premier designer for film, theatre, ballet and opera um, in the, across the whole of the 20th century. Um, but more than that, the, the women in the family had an amazing contribution as well. Muriel Messel, whose, whose story I've tried to bring out in the book, she was an extraordinary independent Edwardian woman a um, very knowledgeable plants woman. She wrote the book 
about all of the flora in Nymans. It's called A Garden Flora. And it's an absolutely extraordinary read. You know, you, you, you just, you're mesmerized by the number of plants, the sophistication of what she's writing about their habits and how they need to be cultivated. Maud Messel, we mentioned in the film, um, she took on Nymans and was responsible, not just for the forecourt garden and the knot garden, but she was responsible for this massive redesign in that period of the 1920s, where the house was completely born again. It was, it was remodeled as this mock medieval manor house. And again, it's fascinating to see that influence coming through for a German Jewish family. Now it's in the second generation, but suddenly they have reinvented themselves as members of the landed gentry with a manor house, with a coat of arms. And, and that transition in the space of one generation, I think is, is fascinating. But there's, there's so many, even into the, the, the most recent generations. Um, Victoria Messel, who um, is another cousin, um, she has founded the Florilegium at Nyman's, so the, the group which does all of the plant painting, and her, her illustrations, a couple of them were in the book, they're absolutely magnificent um, paintings of the flowers and plants. Thomas Messel, you know, a fantastic cabinet maker, and he then indirectly, I suppose, is, is mirrored by David Lindley, who um, is now the second Earl of Snowden, also working in cabinet and furniture design. So there's an extraordinary artistic line alongside the horticultural line. And the other one is the sort of the collecting line. They were great collectors, um, almost to the point of being crazy hoarders. Um, but, you know, really fantastic collections of fans, of, of horticultural books going back to the 15th century, of dresses, of, of netsuke, of, of all sorts of amazing, amazing things. So that, that in a way was one of the nice, the nice colorful bits in writing the book, to be able to draw out all of those different aspects and present them as more than just a sort of tale of, of, of the garden, wonderful though that is, but there's a much greater breadth there. Which I think is what's fascinating about gardens and which I really really love is that we can start by talking about a garden but we always head off into all sorts of places which seemingly are unconnected but of course because gardening is such a metaphor and the garden is such a metaphor it takes us off. I'm fascinated by this idea of collecting and I'm trying to remember which person it was who founded the, jo the Victorian Society? Yes, that was Anne, Countess of Ross, so um, Leonard's daughter. And she really was an extraordinary character. I mean, a very strong-willed character who in the 1930s, coming out of the 20s into the 30s, she was said by the newspapers to be the most beautiful woman in London. And you've got this astonishing pictures of her in all of the um, society magazines of, the, of that time, an extraordinary presence. She then became the Countess of Ross and spent quite a lot of her time living in Ireland at Burr Castle, which is the ancestral home of the, the Rosses, um, but also in London. And 18 Stafford Terrace, which is the home of Linley Sanborn, um, and is now a museum for anyone to be able to go and visit an extraordinary time capsule from the 1890s, just off Kensington High Street. Um, Anne used that as the base from which to found the Victorian Society. And if you think in the 1950s, anything which was associated with Victorian architecture or Victorian paraphernalia was rather frowned upon. Everybody loved the Georgian 18th century, but everybody frowned upon the 19th century. And the Vicsoc, as it's usually re referred to the Victorian society, um, was founded as a deliberate adjunct to the Georgian group to say, we want to do the same thing for the 19th century and indeed for the Edwardian era. And Anne was this extraordinary force who brought together this group of people who were, like her, very interested 
in Victoriana and she set it up and said look this has got to be our mission for the future and it continues today you know the Victorian society today is absolutely crucial if there's any form of development of the Victorian building which could in any way jeopardize it the Victorian society has to be consulted before anything can be done so it's an, a fantastic legacy really which comes out of her drive for conservation for honoring the past and that that instinct to collect and recognize that that objects hold history and are interesting and deserve to be preserved absolutely shall we talk a little bit about the story of and well two questions i'll go i'd like to go back a little bit first to this idea that in the generation leonard's generation a generation down from ludwig that the family was becoming very influential that they'd established themselves in the very upper echelons do you think that was a deliberate play a deliberate policy not to begin with i mean for ludwig he married in a very um humble way so there was no sense that he was aiming at anything grand like that i think it was really that for leonard he he was sent to a very you know he was sent to eton and then he went on to oxford and he then um was very active in the in the territorial forces of the army so he eventually became a lieutenant colonel um, and gradually he became more and more of a pillar of society in Sussex and, and by 1936 he was actually the high sheriff of Sussex um, and he was the one who um, announced the accession of George VI um, as high sheriff of Sussex in, in Lewis um, and gradually that sort of growth into the landed gentry became part of, I think, that the whole idea of what Nyman's was. Because if you think when Ludwig took on Nyman's, he opened it up. He didn't just keep it for the family. It was very much used by the local community. So the Staplefield School had all their annual jamborees and sports days at Nyman's. There was a needlework guild for the girls to come up from Staplefield School and learn a trade. There was all sorts of ways in which he took on the role of the squire. And indeed, in some of the old papers which I looked at, he's referred to, even Ludwig is referred to as the squire of Staplefield. Now, when it went on to the next generation, Leonard had been brought up English. You know, yes. Ludwig spoke with a strong German accent, but his children didn't. And so they gradually grew into the role and before you know it they were very much an established part of society now it's the next generation um, where Anne marries into the nobility with her second marriage to to Michael the sixth Earl of Ross um, and that I suppose is, is another step which would have been completely unthought of you know back in the previous generation and it was from there um, that their son um, her son, sorry, Anne's son from the first marriage, um, he was the one who made this sort of a, abrupt shift by going into the royal family itself and marrying Princess Margaret. So it's a very strange um, social mobility, a climb through, but it was no sense in which it was planned, no. Mm. But, and I suppose it was possible because they were mixing in those circles. Anne was having these lovely soirees, wasn't she? And she was mixing in these social circles whereby Princess Margaret would be a guest. Did I re get, gather that correctly? Yes, that's right. In, in the soirees that they held at 18 Stafford Terrace, yes. the yes. Lindbourne House. Yes. Um, it was wonderful, actually. One of the things when I was researching the photography to have as illustrations in the book, um, it was amazing to find that Henri Cartier-Bresson, the great French photographer, had actually taken images of Anne holding court in, in, in 18 Stafford Terrace. And um, the people who've written up those soirees, I mean, they're just sort of starry-eyed how amazing mm. they were. Yes, it's really, it's really an extraordinary story. Um, I'm just thinking where I'd like to take it. Have you, have I missed anything? Um, Do, have we missed anything that was of particular interest that you'd like to talk about? Well, I suppose one of the things to go back to is, is to think about Nyman's as a garden and what it represents for us 
as ordinary people going and visiting it as people who like to visit gardens because it's got this very specialist very um exotic side to it of all of the plants which were cultivated and 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 new varieties which were made but there's another side to it which i think is always um really fascinating that when you go to Nymans yourself, and you know, I've, I'm, I live in London in a terraced house, I've got a, a tiny, tiny garden. You can still come away with these wonderful ideas for what you could try, which would be pushing away from your comfort zone. So for example, we here in London, we've got a, a little pot in which we grow a salvia and it's a very, common in garden salvia. It's the one called hot lips, which lots of people have. It's very um, abundant. And, and when you rub against it, it's got a wonderful fragrance um, from, from the leaves. But you go to Nyman's and there's this fantastic bed of all different types of salvias. And you think to yourself, hmm, you know, there's that gorgeous deep indigo salvia. And really, I'd like to have that one alongside, I mean, you can't have too many plants in our little tiny handkerchief garden, but you know, we'd love to have that one. And, and that's what I think is great about Nyman's. It's got exciting plants, which ordinary people with our type of ordinary gardens can still try ourselves. And you get that inspiration every time you go. And particularly, this is, I think, one of the amazing things about it, which I've been really lucky to be able to see over the last couple of years. Nyman's has something for every season. You know, you go there from, I mean, I was very lucky to be there really right at the beginning of the year this year, and people just sitting around luxuriating in these, these wonderful carpets of crocuses and daffodils. You then move on, and this brilliant display of the magnolias and the early trees, then you move on from there to what we're having now, um, the, the fantastic flowering shrubs, the rhododendrons, which are absolutely everywhere, but it continues all the way through. You have the June borders, you have the high summer borders, and then um, towards the end of the, the, the season, you have this fantastic Eucryphia, which was developed at Nymans, the Eucryphia nymansensis nymanse, and that is a late flowering tree, um, which means that you can go there in August, September, and still have that type of interest. So, you know, it, it's fascinating how you get that that mix of a, of a gardener's garden, both for the specialists, but also for us who are slightly more down to earth gardeners who love it, perhaps, but perhaps don't have the same level of expertise. And that, you're absolutely right, because when when I came and met you there in preparation for this talk, I was really taken by the erythroniums, mm. um, which are a bulb. And when we were we there in April? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and they, I, yeah, I was, I was down, I was down on my knees, practically capturing those little noddy faces and nodding heads, and just beautiful. And the hellebores. Well, you're, in, you're in, you're in good company because it was the erythroniums which um, Vita Sackville West particularly picked up on when she came in 1954 for the handover of Nyman's from the Messel family to the National Trust. She wrote it up in her column, her gardening column in the paper that weekend and said, you know, absolutely wonderful everything that was there, but particularly she focused in on the erythronium. She thought it was a, a, a beautiful, um, very, very delicate, you know, sort of plant, which if you're not careful, you can walk straight past. But that's where I think, you know, it was wonderful for me going around with you, Sarah, because you could actually pick out all of those um, jewels in the, in the beds and make sure I didn't miss them. <laughs> and it was all the small stuff as well. There's a lovely perennial layer and bulb layer underneath all these wonderful shrubs that we're talking about. Mm, and mm. I'm inspired, I've got erythroniums on my list because I don't have any in the garden yet. <laughs> so they're on my list for, for when I can order them in August. <laughs> uh, so that was, I think we could open up to questions. Do you think so, John? I think absolutely. It'd be great to hear. Um, what, what other people have to say. Um, obviously, you know, only only one or two of these advanced copies made it into the country. Um, so I'm afraid very few people have actually been able to read the book as yet. Um, but I'd be fascinated to hear what people have as their questions, either having seen it or not. Absolutely. Well, can I just um, say, we've had a couple of questions in advance. So um, I don't know, we certainly had one from Steve Allen. I don't know, Steve, whether you want to unmute and pose the question 
yourself if you're happy to do that. Yes, certainly. Uh, John, congratulations on the book. Um, it tells um, a fascinating story of the Messels and their journey through Europe in the 19th and um, 20th centuries. And it's against um, a, a turbulent backdrop in social history at the same time throughout Europe. So for example, the anti-German rioting in East London in 1915. Um, how, how did you know which of these kind of events to weave into the, to the story? And how, how did your research lead you to that? I think perhaps that the, the thing which became clear to me going through is if it's going to be a social history, which of course any, any family history, if it's going to be more than just a family snapshot, it's got to be a social history. It means you're picking out the aspects of the historical record which had most impact on people. So it's not trying to be another grand historical meta-narrative at that high level, um, but it's actually saying, how did these things affect people in their everyday lives? So for example, the, the element that you, you, you mentioned, Steve, with the riots which took place in 1915 in London and across actually other bits of Britain um, were very much targeted against Germans because it was in the wake of um, the beginning of the First World War, the sinking of the Lusitania by a German U-boat, which went down with the loss of over a thousand lives, lots of them women and children. This sparked a real sense of anger against the Germans who were living in Britain, even if they were naturalized British and had been there for 40, 50 years. So this had an immense impact on Ludwig Messel. I mean, really, we see that this was the beginning of, of, of the end of his life. I mean, he died um, in the summer of, of, of 1915 as a result. His brother, Rudolf Messel, the chemist, he had a stroke as a result of the, um, the, the, the huge stress of coming under those type of, of pressures. So I wanted really, rather than necessarily talking too much about the high level conflict between the German Navy and the British Navy or the, the German Imperial and the British monarchical systems, I wanted to bring it right down to earth. And I think that that also worked when looking back earlier in the German history. So as a Jewish family within Germany, in the earlier part of the 19th century, the Messels had been incredibly successful. You know, they managed to, to, to really work their way into a position of some prosperity. And yet they were still vulnerable to the, the, the same sort of um, anti-Jewish riots in 1819 in particular, as you see as anti-German riots in 1915. So it's that, 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 that human history What's happening at the ground level? That's what I really tried to bring out um, rather than focusing all the time on, on the sort of history you have to learn at school, which is the top level history, which doesn't always filter through to have an impact on people. Lovely, thank you. Um, yeah, Sarah, we've got a question from Penny Stern. Um, why has the house not been restored after the fire? Um, there has been a response from Rebecca. Um, who um, says that the house wasn't restored because of restrictions on building materials. Um, John, do you want to add anything to that or Rebecca, would you like to? Rebecca, go for, go for it, do you? Hi, um, I think there was obviously a will to restore it, but um, materials were rationed and it simply wasn't possible. And also, I guess there was heartbreak in the family in that the house had been destroyed probably it was just a bit too much of a stretch for an elderly couple to contemplate. That's my view. Mm. And for people who don't know, Rebecca has been the house manager at Nyman's for over 20 years and knows more about it than anybody really. Um, and I'm really thrilled that, that she was able to be so much a part of, of the history, the research and everything which went into the book. Um, so it, I think that's absolutely right, isn't it? I mean, it was a massive project for Leonard and Maud Messel to build this medieval, this mock medieval manor house through the 1920s. They had to scour the country for old masonry um, to build it. It's not something that, you know, when you're in your 60s, you can suddenly just do again. 
And I think that, that it was, as you say, that the trauma of, of seeing all of that hard work go up in flames, plus the fact that this was an immediate, it, I mean, it burnt down in 1947. It was still at the height of rationing. You can't just suddenly magic a, another building into, in, into existence. Um, with, there's a message from Open City School. I'm not sure who that who that is, but uh, I'd like to ask John about Lindley Lambourne, uh, Maud's father, and one of the leading cartoonists of his day, and to ask if he thinks the creative ability demonstrated by some um, of the Messel family might have come from him. Yes. So Lindley Lambourne um, was for for many 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 years one of the principal cartoonists for Punch. And it's amazing when you see the full range of his work, not just in Punch, but also um, beyond that. I've actually been doing lots of nice research with Shirley Nicholson, who is one of the great authorities on Lindley Sanborn, um, to find out all of the other places where he did work for. And if you want to see some of that, I, I thoroughly recommend going to 18 Stafford Terrace, where there's a magnificent um, uh, exhibition of his work. Maud definitely inherited some of that artistic ability. We have drawings which she, she did for other um, magazines of the time. And we've got her own drawings where she was trying to think up sketches for the redesign of the house and indeed of the garden. So when you have that, Maud's interest together with the artistic side coming from the German bit of the family, I think that it did create this wonderful flowering of cultural creativity in the next generations. And we've talked a little bit already when Sarah was saying about Oliver Messel and all of the others, that there is a wonderful, rich tapestry, which I'm sure, yes, drew from the Sanborn side, as well as the Messel side of the family. Um, Helen's asked if you could walk around the garden with one member of the family today, which would that be? And she says what she's really asking is who is your favourite? <laughs> That's a bit low. Well, I realise I should say that it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's the old members of the family, not the current members, because that would be awkward. <laughs> uh, it's a really hard question. I mean, it would be wonderful to walk around with Ludwig because he was the one who started it all. He was the one who had the vision. He was the one who came over from Germany. Uh, you know, it would be just such an amazing thing to reach back into history and to say, you know, what were the impulses behind it? What, what was your experience coming and living in a foreign country from the age of 18? How did you feel you fitted in in Sussex society? I mean, there's wonderful, there's wonderful evidence from newspaper reports that he was welcomed, um, even though I'm sure people looked at him as being slightly different, but he was welcomed in as a member of society like that. Um, but I don't know, I mean, to say, was he my favorite person? I don't know, you know, he had a very different um, career trajectory from mine. One of, one of the bits which I really loved writing for the book, which hasn't really been told before, was the story of the younger Rudolf Messel, who was my mother's uncle. Um, and he had an extraordinary life as well as a writer, as a filmmaker, a committed um, political activist and a pacifist. Um, and, and you can see again, a completely different strand of the story coming through in his life. So, you know, there are just so many different directions that the book goes in. I, I, I'd hate to pick a favourite, but I think if I was going to walk around Nyman's, it would be wonderful to walk around with Ludwig. Mm. And it'd be fascinating to know what he thinks of, about what's happened to the family and their contribution and looking back, looking forward, but looking back. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I think he'd be thrilled that that connection was still there. I mean, I think he'd be thrilled to know that members of the family regularly go back to Nyman's and, and see it very much as a place to gather and to have, you know, important, memorable family events. I mentioned my uncle's funeral coming up, but we've had a many other um, very happy events there as well. In fact, um, with Helen having just asked the previous question, um, I remember her marriage. <laughs> um, 
John, we've got a more of a sort of botanical horticultural question from Robert Hillier. Um, was the book on Nyman's flowers and plants that you mentioned ever published? It was published and it was incredibly well received, actually. Um, one of the things I put in the book was, oh, look, in fact, if you can look down at the bottom, there is um, from Ireland. One of the copies of it is being held up in front of your screen. I'm not sure that you've all got the same people in front of you as I have, but um, yes. Cousin Alison and, and William are holding up a copy um, there. <laughs> and in fact, actually, it is available online. If you um, search, you can find that the whole of the book has been digitised um, and put up there. Oh, I see. That was the the inscription as well. Um, it was really well received, not just for the content, which was seen to be, you know, revolutionary, that you've got all these plants which have never really been grown successfully before, but you've got instructions as to how to make it more likely that you could also do that in your own garden. But also it was physically a very beautiful book. I mean, the copies which we, we have still, it is physically a lovely book to hold. But um, as well as the ones, you know, the, the reviews from the time, which were, were wonderfully positive, there was a wonderful one done by the Daily Telegraph garden correspondent in the 1980s. And he said, what's amazing about this book, looking back on it 60 years later, ah, yes, indeed, the, the, the pictures and the drawings within it. Um, he said, it reads like a horticultural debret. He said it's basically such an amazing uh, collection of these, these noble and exotic plants, which really very few of us know about, that you are left with your head spinning when you, when you read it. So it was published. It is available online. Um, if anybody wants to try to, to find it and can't find it, I'm very happy to send a link. Um, and you can, find, you can contact me if you want by the... the the website address which is um, I've set up for the book which is just from refugees to royalty.com and if you go to from refugees to royalty.com there is a, um, a contact thing there so I can easily send the link to anybody who wants to see it. Thank you and Sarah there's a question for you just staying with the plants I think it was erythronium was the plant yes. that you saw. Well I just googled it so I'll spell it for you. <laughs> It's E R Y T H R O N I U M. And the one, there's a Dens Canis, which is, I think, the one that we were looking at when we were there. D E N S dash C A N I S. But there's lots of beautiful, I'm looking at pictures of them now. There's lots of beautiful ones. Thank you. Um, John, a question from Charlie. Uh, it, it seems that your emphasis is on a quick and successful transition in the upper echelons of society by the Messel family. But did some Germanic cultural elements remain going into further generations and potentially even being translated into the property in the garden? Mm, no, that's a really, really good question. And it is absolutely correct that even though the next generation saw themselves as very English, they were all brought up to speak German the library at home in their London home was filled with all of the German classics, Goethe, Schiller, all of the ones which, you know, you were brought up on if you were brought up in Germany itself. And even down into the next generation, um, German was seen as something which you had to learn when you were growing up. So my grandmother, Phoebe Messel, she grew up not just learning German, but also became a translator of German poetry and things like that. So that that Germanic um, link did continue to the next generations. Whether or not you can say it is in evidence in the properties it, when you get past that, I don't know if that's so clear. Um, there are certain things, certain elements, which you can see have been passed down as treasures from a Germanic background. Um, and some of those have, have, have survived, some of them haven't within the family. But when you look at the collecting habits of people like Leonard Messel, they were focused very, very wide, much, much wider than any particular country. And if you think, for example, um, when they were building Nyman's, Nyman's was a place which they could fill with the collections of old English furniture. They had a, an extraordinary collection of old English furniture from 
Jacobean, Stuart, um, even Tudor times, which I think must have been incredibly uncomfortable um, as things to sit on, but very um, spectacular if you see them within the context of a manor house. So I think, yeah, the, 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 German, the German element definitely continued into the next generation, um, but it's not always quite as visible, perhaps. And I'm remembering that you showed me, it's more about the Jewish element, but you showed me a mug and David, didn't you, in the wall? That's Just right. a little tiny, tiny, what would you call it? Like a little... This is, it's like a sort of relief bit of stone yeah. as, you, as you go in through what they had reconstructed as the as the new main entrance. So what's now over on the southeast side of, of the house. As you go in, you go underneath the escutcheon, so the, 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 the coat of arms of the Messel family. And then just on the right, you have this little Star of David, um, which seems to be just a, one of the very few open references to the Jewish heritage um, in the family there. Um, but, you know, even that, as you say, it was, it was very much known as it went down through the generations. There's a, a lovely story where Oliver Messel was visiting Peter Sellers in hospital, Peter Sellers, the Pink Panther comic actor. But I think it was either that way around, or, or either Peter Sellers was being visited or Peter Sellers was visiting Oliver. And they were joking with each other. And Oliver said, ah, yes, well, of course, as two Jewish boys, da 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 da, da. So that, that history was known. But I think it's only really recently that it's being drawn out. And again, the National Trust has been really, really good about drawing out all of the aspects of the family history, um, taking part in the European Jewish days of cultural celebration and things like that. So that's another uh, really nice thing, I think, as a story to bring out. Following on from that, um, Linda's asked, will you be pursuing further research on the family and do you have another book in mind? <laughs> well, what, what's been really nice for me is that the, the research into this particular family, which happens to be our family, um, has also sparked a whole lot of other different avenues of research into other German Jewish families who came over to Britain at the same time. Um, I think if you if you go to a lot of the uh, Jewish museums around the place, particularly if you go to North London and the Jewish Museum there, the focus is very much on the larger number of Jewish immigrants to this country after the pogroms of 1881, and, and particularly the, the, the immigrants who came from Poland, Ukraine, Russia, which of course were numerically far, far greater than um, the German Jewish ones, who were slightly more of the bourgeois, um, middle class end of things. But I think what's fascinating is when you do look at those German Jewish immigrants, um, they had their own particular society here in Britain. They were often very, very high achievers. Um, they had amazing art collections. And that's what I've been trying to draw out at the moment, a, a, a sense of, you know, what inspired them? What was this extraordinary cultural force that they brought with them? And what does it represent in terms of them transferring the high culture they learned in Germany over into the British context? So I must say that's been absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the next, uh, the next sort of direction. Mm. Well, um, Rebecca's also um, asked about the most exciting revelation that you've come across while researching the book. One of the really nice things was um, Oliver Messel, who has, of all of the Messels, he's had most written about him. So in a way, you'd think that there was nothing left to find. Um, but going down and being able to look through the archive of his um, in Bristol, the Bristol University Theatre Collection has the Oliver Messel archive. Um, that was fascinating because for the first time, you could see that he had a very strong anti-racist um, line in his, in his own life. Even though most of his time he was spent partying and doing his wonderful ballet sets and stage designs. For example, when he was asked by the South African authorities whether they could stage in the 1970s a reproduction of the, of the um, Sleeping Beauty ballet, which he did in Covent Garden in 1946, which was really, really one of his greatest moments. Um, he said he wouldn't allow 
his production to be put on in South Africa as long as apartheid was there, because he said he just couldn't under he couldn't bear the fact that it would actually be impossible for black people to go and watch it alongside the the, the, the poor, the South African minority, and um, and you begin to sort of pick that up at many different stages in his career that he took a stand at a time when this was not necessarily you know, quite as accepted a thing as it is now. Um, so I think that, that that was a wonderful thing to find. Um, and, and it really gave me a much sort of deeper um, respect for what Oliver represented in his life. Thank you. And um, Jane has asked about the origin of the name Nyman's. Yes, well, this was something which was rather shrouded in mystery. Um, it seems that this was a corruption of um, a word Ninians, because back in the 14th century, I think it was, there was a Philip Ninian who owned the property. That was, that was where it came from. So Ninian became Nymans as a result of that sort of corruption over time. I thought your question was going to be, um, what was the origin of the name Messel? Um, which was another nice thing actually to find out. Some of the German sources had said that you, you trace back the name Messel to the Roman, the Latin Massilla, which is what the Romans called it, but they called it Massilla because of the Celtic word Massal, and the Celtic word Massal means iron ore, or particularly iron ore found in a bog, so bog ore. And that was because when they set up the Celts, when they moved into the area around Messel, they settled there because it had these deposits of iron ore from which, of course, they could make all of the iron weapons and iron um, tools that they needed. Um, so that was another bit of nice, nice discovery in, in writing the book. Well, I've got one more question that came in actually um, earlier, which, well, it's a couple together. It was posed... Um, by uh, one of the Bradleys, Linda or Dom. Um, I've wondered how you went about writing the book. Did you research and write the chapters one at a time or did you approach the book as a whole? And also which chapter did you enjoy writing the most? Mm. <laughs> I mean, certainly for the first question, because the book does cover a really broad span, I did have to take it in chunks. So if you think I was going to be spending some time looking into the early records of the family in German sources, I had to really immerse myself in that. Then looking at when, for example, the Messels came and settled in Sussex, I had this wonderful time going to Chichester to the West Sussex record office there and looking at the old um, the, the archives they had and also looking now at the old Sussex newspapers which are available online um, so then I actually immersed myself in that writing about Tony Armstrong Jones and his marriage to, to Princess Margaret I had to immerse myself in all of the royal biographies which is um, was a new thing for me um, and, and, and quite fun in its own way so each time you've got to take on an entirely different um, set of sources. And really, I think for me, that was what was so fascinating about it. It was a wonderful learning experience to do the research put into to writing the book. As for the, the second question, which was the chapter I, I most liked writing, there was a particular joy, I think, for me in the chapter on Alfred Messel. Alfred Messel was Ludwig's brother. He was the only one of that generation who stayed in Germany and he rose to become a really well-known architect at the beginning of the of the 20th century. Um, if anybody who's been to Berlin and been to the Pergamon Museum, this was his great sort of last creation. Um, and it was wonderful to drawing out the full story behind his life and career, um, which hasn't really properly ever been told in, in this country before. It was something which was able to be sort of brought in um, from, from that German side of things. And he was interesting, of course, in terms of Neumann's as well, because when Ludwig wanted to extend the building, the, the, the first house at Neumann's, he got his brother, the architect, Alfred Messel, to do it. 
And it's wonderful when you look at the, the results of that because you had a Regency house, which is what was there before. And Alfred Messel put onto the edge of the Regency house, this Renaissance tower, which was then a link to the extension he put on, which was like an Alpine chalet. <laughs> And it was great because the next generations just thought, this is hideous. You've got a Regency villa with a Renaissance tower and an Alpine chalet roof. It, it, it was such a mishmash. And that I think is what really was the impulse behind the big redesign when Leonard and Maud came in and they just said, look, we can't live in this, 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 this architectural hodgepodge. Um, and they then created the medieval manor house which we see the ruins of today. Well, th thank you to everyone for all of those amazing questions. It's made it, it's really brought everything to life. But Sarah, that's all the questions we've got, unless anyone's got anything else that they would like to, would like to ask. No? No. I, I, I have another question, which we didn't really cover in the first, but you and I have talked about, which is that fascinating fact about baptizing the children. Mm. Vic baptised his children with um, Leonard, Leonard at the age of 13 when he went to Eton being baptised and then the others being baptised and then the youngest being baptised at the right moment when she was only weeks old. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and what you told me I think was really fascinating? Yeah I think it's, it's, really interesting. Interesting. it's a really interesting part of that whole sort of transition from being German Jews in the 19th century were very secular if you think about the, the, the tradition that they'd come from, which was a much more closed religious Judaism, and that's the sort of tradition which could continued in Eastern Europe, for German Jews, they became much more secular, much more integrated, acculturated within um, German mainstream society. So that by the time Ludwig came over, he didn't really, he wasn't religiously motivated, it seems. And so when his children were born, he, he married um, Annie Cussens, a, a woman who was a Christian, who had been brought up in, in, in the Christian faith. Um, when he married her, Ludwig doesn't really seem to have, have been particularly bothered. And in fact, that seems to have led to the fact that the children were not baptized until very late. So Leonard um, and his brother Harold were baptized pretty much on the eve of going to Eton. Um, because it, it was an Anglican school, it was a time when you'd get much greater participation if you'd come from a Church of England background. Um, but it is a fascinating reflection on, on, on that drift which has been described in the academic literature, the drift away from Judaism, which characterised a lot of the German Jews who came to Britain, so that you see quite a lot of um, English Jews at the time complaining that the German Jews who'd come over weren't really pulling their weight. They weren't joining synagogues. They weren't really as active as they could be. Ludwig did remain very, very conscious of his Jewish roots. All of his first partners in business were from Jewish backgrounds. He became a member of the Anglo-Jewish Association. A lot of the um, donations to charity which he gave were to Jewish causes. So he was very clear, clear about his Jewish backgrounds. It's just that he'd come from a German Jewish background which was much more secular and that I think is what then meant he felt yeah fine if, 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 if the kids are going to be brought up in the Church of England um, let them let them have that experience instead. Yeah fascinating. Sarah there is one last question that's come in from Robert um, is there a Messel branch in Germany today? There isn't. Um, and actually, one of the interesting bits of the story, and indeed, um, which, which Nymans is now also carrying on, is part of that education as to what happened to the last uh, Messels who stayed in Germany. This was um, our cousin Irene and her um, husband Wolfgang and the two children they stayed in Germany until the 1930s. But of course, under the Nazi Nuremberg laws, they were considered to be Jews, even though they'd also been brought up as Lutherans. So they were brought out of Germany with the Messel family here acting as personal sponsors to guarantee um, their probity as they were brought over. So they escaped really just four months before the outbreak of, of, of the Second World War. 
and had they stayed, I'm afraid their fate would have been the same fate as so many millions of other um, Jews who perished. Um, what's so there's no there's no German presence. What is fascinating is that there is an American side of the Messel family, which nobody really knew about before. Um, one of the older brothers back in the day had emigrated from Germany to the United States and everybody thought he'd got lost on passage. But it turned out from the research I did that he, he didn't get lost. He, he set up as a teacher in Ohio. He got married to another German immigrant, had you know, children, two boys who then had lots of other boy children. So it, it, there are no messels in, 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 in Germany, but if you go to Indiana and Ohio and other states in the USA, you can find quite a lot of messels there, which is probably our next, um, our next uh, mission is to try to make contact with them rather better. Well, Humphrey's asking, are we going to have to wait 12 years for your next book? <laughs> 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 I must say this was a real labor of love. I mean, it really was something where I felt that I was um, learning so much along the way about bits of history and social history that I didn't know about before. Um, and of course I was doing that research while also working full time um, to bring in a, a, a more normal income. Um, I hope it won't take quite that long, um, but I think, you know, the, the, the joy of having this book here is it, it is, enabling people to, to take part in that in that whole journey of the Messel family, which of course took place over far longer than 12 years. Um, so I think I'm going to try and, and, and enjoy this bit um, for the next few months and then think about um, the next book thereafter. That we have a slight problem that the actual main consignment of the books um, is, is still trying very slowly to make its way back to Britain. Um, from being printed in the Far East. And unfortunately, you may have heard of the, the traffic jam in the Suez Canal um, caused by that boat which got stuck the wrong way around. Well, apparently this has actually caused havoc with all of the shipping of books and lots of other things to Britain. So um, it's possible to order the book as of now, but there's still going to be a couple more weeks um, until it arrives in the country. So hold on. <laughs> Going back to that reference of it taking 12 years, having been one of the very lucky ones to have an early copy, I'm not surprised. I think it's the most extraordinary piece of research, really. And when you talk about the different chunks and the different chapters, I think your research is amazing. And what I love about it is that it's very readable. Oh. It, isn't, it isn't dense. It's very readable and fascinating. So buy it, everybody. You'll want it. <laughs> so much. I'm really, I'm really so um, grateful to you for having put so much energy and, and commitment into reading it so carefully and engaging with it. Um, well, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And also, big thanks to you, Victoria, and to Jane for for having held this as part of the Chelsea Fringe um, week of activities, which has been a really lovely um, coming together. Chelsea Fringe. Yeah, yes. Yeah. The, the Hello, can I can I just say something from the 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 publishers, uh, Peter Owen, um, that um, we'd like to thank John Hillary for giving us uh, a marvelous addition to to our list, and uh, you know we hope it's um, a great success. We're sure it will be. Thank you, thank, so you. thank you, Nick and Antonio, for for showing that type of um, commitment as well. It's really really appreciated. Thank you.